or anything like this, but uh, you know, we'll 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 try our best. I mean, we're both. Yeah. Good. Well, it's edited afterwards, so I can safely scrap this one, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. Okay. Going to make a start. <clears throat> We've just had elections in two of the most important states in the Middle East, Israel and Iran. Uh, in this second of two special episodes of In the Zone, I'm talking with Sharon Dolev about Israel. Sharon is founder and executive director of METO, a longtime courageous activist for peace in Israel. Proud to be Israeli, she is also passionate about change within the country. She has worked within political parties and other organizations in Israel and set up and ran the Israeli disarmament movement. She, with a little help from me, dreamed the impossible idea of the Middle East Treaty Organization back in 2016 after hosting roundtables in Tel Aviv and is now bringing it to reality. She's also a close friend. We're going to talk now about the background to the Israeli election, but most importantly, the impacts of those uh, the, this election on regional peace and security and prospects for the zone. So, Sharon, thinking about the election, Hi, hi. hi. Good to have you on. <laughs> thinking about this election, <clears throat> was this an anti Netanyahu wave that the media seemed to interpret it as? Was it really about one personality? And if so, what does that suggest about the future cohesion of this new government? Well, it's, it's a very complex question, but before I say this, I, I, first, I love the introduction. It's, it was a very generous introduction, but there was one word that jumped to me, and from that I'll go to, the, to, to answering your question, and that was proud to be Israeli. I'm not a proud Israeli, and the reason I'm not a proud Israeli is because I don't think there's anything to be proud of, not because Israel is behaving this way or that way, it's because I think I'm an Israeli because I was born in Israel. And that a state is not something that you should be proud of or not proud of. A state is supposed to be the, the body that I give money to, to run my life as smoothly as possible. And if I'm taking this, I'll take it back to your question. Tanya was doing it uh, the wrong way. He was doing the opposite. Like most of the leaders in the Middle East and the vast majority of leaders around the world, the leaders of the states are not working to benefit the people of the state. And when you look at the sec at security questions, you see usually a huge gap between what is the security for the person and the security uh, of the state. And when it came to Netanyahu, the state became him. He was the protector of Israel, the protector of the Jewish people. And basically what it meant that he gave pompous uh, speeches uh, about Iran at the UN and not much more than that. Apart from that, Netanyahu was willing to destroy the structure of Israel as long as he remained in seat. And that's what generated the movement anti-Netanyahu. It was not a movement against a person, it was really, I think, and I believe, a movement of pro-Israel. Let's preserve something of what we believe we grew on. And that's why it made this government possible. If it was just anti-Netanyahu, and that's what most people see. I mean, the vast majority of, of the conversation in Israel is like that. It was anti-Netanyahu. Mm. But I don't think that only anti-Netanyahu could have made this government work, or at least start to work. I think it was really a vision of after Netanyahu, he did enough damage that now we, we need to do something to save what is left. Mm. What is left of the judicial system, what is left of the police, what is left of the health system, but what is, what is left of the belief of people in this system. Mm. So Netanyahu, as you say, uh, joined himself to the state and thereby in, in many different ways corrupted the state. Uh, he's, uh, he's accused of all sorts of corruption. Uh, do you think he's going to be exposed now to legal action? And what do you think the political consequences of chasing Netanyahu at this point will then have? Well, because I have such strong feelings about Netanyahu, um, of course, I would love to see him go to court. I'd love to see him go to court. Sadly, he's going to court to the things that I less care about. Um, but, but there was a major corruption 
and not to see him in court will mean that um that that it's almost like saying it's okay to behave in such a corrupted way um but most people don't feel as much about it because the corruption was seemingly um mild mm-hmm. most of it i'm not talking about the submarines because the submarines touched the base issue of security but he's not going to court on that one mm-hmm. for some reason very strange mm-hmm. he's going to court for a uh, giving favors for better coverage on the news for getting receiving uh, gifts that made him look like a lord you know cigars and champagne um things that made him look like king bibi and most people in israel actually like that they have a king so he's going to call to something that most people think is very mild not not that important mm-hmm. and the wh- while there's an importance for for him going there most people that follow netanyahu believe that uh, this is the system against netanyahu mm-hmm. so their anger will be with the system there's also a fair chance that the new president will pardon him before he goes to trial so i i would like to see him go to trial i would like to see him go to trial and i would like to see him go to jail but that's because i believe he's a criminal but not for these things i would like to see him go to jail for what he has done to the society for the hate for the for the mistrust for the way he divided us Uh, in a way that i mean in 96 he started uh, he started with saying the leftist forgot what it is like to be a jew and suddenly everybody if you don't agree with him you're not a, legit, a legitimate israeli this is what he's done to the society okay, he, okay let's 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 yeah. thank, thanks let's i think it's really clear and uh and and i'm sure that a lot of americans listening to this will will feel a certain recognition there um and and like trump netanyahu sucked all the attention uh uh towards himself and made the issue about him and and i guess we've done i've done that in asking you these questions so what i'd like to do now is just draw a line behind this guy put him in the box where he deserves to be whether that's in prison or somewhere else and now focus on this new government so this new government Sharon what are your hopes and fears around this government uh, particularly when it comes to regional and foreign policy I, i mean will it be coherent um despite its diversity or, or is its diversity part of its strength both as always <laughs> So when it comes to security issues this government is as divided as possible and but we will see it on more local issues we'll see it mainly when it comes to the Palestinians sadly when it comes to more regional issues i don't think that we will see much difference here and when it comes to the iran deal the jcpoa or to israel participation in international forums when it that the deal with the weapons of mass destruction i think that we won't see much difference at all and that mainly because they don't discuss it and they don't know how to discuss it and they were not exposed to most of the discussions around it if there were and I'll, i'll i'm sorry to bring back netanyahu but one thing that you could have seen is that even though those reporters that never believed anything he said those who believed nothing that came out of his mouth when it came to iran they just cited him without criticism without asking questions and sometimes even those who are now in the new government those who were in the opposition my friends in the in the left parties when when they it came to iran they cited him because there's no knowledge because reporters here don't know what questions to ask and they and and there was no not enough courage amongst those who know to speak on time when the first iran deal was discussed and now they regret it so this is really important and and i'd like the, us to just just delve a little bit more into it because i think there's the key here to the question that i think is on the minds of many many people who look at the uh, challenges of the middle east and uh, the way israel um relates to them uh 
the key here is is that the, there Israel is a democracy. Israel has a uh, free media of of types, and yet the the education of the the people, the education of the journalists, the discussions that are, would be necessary to uh, to a lively and healthy democracy, they're just not there. So so I guess my question is, if they're not there, what are the keys to unlocking that challenge in Israel today? So there's a, a, there's a huge discussion that we can have about what is a democracy. Mm. So I'll agree with you that Israel has democratic procedures, but we never, we never had democratic behavior or democratic uh, education, okay? We, we didn't learn what democracy means apart from the fact that we, the, but, but the procedures. So we have the procedures, but if you look at ambiguity, it's one of the biggest examples. Um, we ambiguity do not of nuclear, nuclear possession. Yeah, yeah. the new, nuclear ambiguity, because nobody told us that we're not allowed to. We knew it somehow by ourselves. There is no legislation, there's no rule about it, and yet we think it's not uh, legal to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, the question was always just about, just about um, uh, whether Israel possess or not possess nuclear weapons, and somehow we managed to not discuss any of the issues related, not the waste, not, not uh, energy, nothing. And if we are a democracy, if, if we are a democratic state, how come that none of the green organizations never done anything about the possible pollution in Dimona city next to the reactor? How come, I'm, so, so this is not, we, there was never a democratic discussion when it came to security in general, and definitely not when it comes to, to nuclear issues. And that, that is because, to hit the, try to hit the nail on the head, that is because there is an almost universal acceptance that Israel is surrounded by enemies and requires some capability to, to respond to its neighbors to create peace and security with the emphasis on security. Is that, is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's not because it's not something that is uh, de debatable. Mm. We are surrounded by enemies. Mm -hmm. uh, whether they should have stayed our enemies or we could have done something about it, that's a totally different question. But we are surrounded by enemies. Even those states that have um, peace agreements with us, they don't have normalization. We don't feel secure. Um, and we have a known history. Mm. So... So yeah, this is what this is one part of it, but this is not the reason why there is secrecy. The secrecy and the not and, and the ability of not discussing things is because we don't have a democratic society that asks why is that a secret and how does it keep us safe? Because if you look at the secret, nobody else knows that it's the secret. You know, when when I went to my first uh, non-proliferation treaty meeting at the UN, I was shocked. And, you know, I'm a lefty, I know how the world works, and yet I was shocked. All the states talked about our nuclear weapons, everybody. And none of them said alleged or according to foreign sources. They just talked about our nuclear weapons as if it's a reality. Like, how rude of them. And only in Israel, we don't discuss any of it. Mm -hmm. so, so who are they keeping the secret from? They're keeping the secrets from the green organizations, from human rights organizations, and from peace organizations, and from an internal discourse. That's who are they protected and the from. And the secrecy sounds like it's a symbol of fragility and weakness, because if they were confident, then there would be no problem with having a public debate because the public debate would be based upon support, overwhelming support amongst Israelis for an independent nuclear deterrent. Is that Probably. right? Yeah. Probably the vast majority of Israelis will support the fact that we have nuclear weapons. And yet, right now, this is something that they can put or take money out. Uh, they can take care or not take care of whatever waste that they throw around the reactor without any supervision. Um, they are, Israel is taking part in international discourse and even, even threatened Iran with nuclear weapons. I mean, right. when Netanyahu stands in front of the reactor, 
and and gives a speech and say if Iran will do this, well, this is this is a leader of a nuclear armed state standing when, with his weapons behind him, threatened Iran, and nobody in Israel is even realizing that our prime minister just because if it's not in the discourse, people don't think like that. So so they they don't. Like there's a whole discourse that goes above our head. Israel is participating, but not Israelis. Mm. And not Israelis also mean the members of parliament and the ministers and those who are supposed to be a little bit more engaged in this discourse. Mm. Do, you think, do you think this election, uh, its results and the movement and the leadership has any possibility of starting to address these taboos we're talking about or... or uh, I mean, is there any slither of hope that that at some point a future Israeli government will put its hand up and say, yes, we do have nuclear weapons. Uh, we are in a, an environment where we feel the need to have nuclear weapons, but we want to reach out and have a dialogue, have a discussion, take part in the global conversation about nuclear disarmament. So I have an answer and it's said and vain at the same time. Mm. No, I don't think that they're going to. However, I do think that it's, this, is the, this is the job of, of the Israeli disarmament movement or the remains of the Israeli disarmament movement or METO in Israel. You know, there's no uh, legal uh, uh, movement in Israel, but, but mm -hmm. there are some people like me that it's, um, it's our job. We need to now go to this new government to find our path to this new government and, uh, and, and, and try to force the discourse on them somehow mm -hmm. um, or to invite them to the, dis to, to the discourse, right. give them the information that was missing and allow them to talk to those who usually don't speak with them and, and ask questions and maybe to, to and, and that might sound a bit maternalistic, allow them the room to ask the question that, that maybe they don't dare to ask because there was so little discourse. Mm. And I, but I think that there is lots of ignorance there, and I think that it's dangerous. So if there is uh, some shift as a result of the new government, it is possibly a little bit movement away from simply opposition and protest towards drawing them into a conversation that is more informed, uh, but that, that would also, I assume, require a greater level of public uh, education and uh, information. I mean, I guess what I'm what I'm inching towards here is 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 you, Sharon, displaying a little bit of your um, plans for action over the coming months and years. So to say years when it comes to an Israeli government is being super optimistic. Mm -hmm. uh, but so if we're talking about the upcoming uh, few months. Mm -hmm. um, as you, as you know, we are now about to finish a new draft. And that's a very good uh, reason to talk to Israeli reporters. And can, I, can I just butt in here, just to clarify, a new draft of the draft treaty that yes. the Middle East Treaty Organization has been uh, developing over the last few years. Sorry. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. So, oh. so it, it might give us a good reason um, and, and the upcoming November conference and the upcoming NPT might give us a good reason to talk to reporters in Israel, try to feed them or, or to, to brief them. So they'll know how to cover it in a bit different way. Now that they don't have Netanyahu to cite, I mean, Netanyahu will, t will, will continue talking about it as head of opposition, mm -hmm. but now they have other people to cite and now they can ask different questions. But those who they should cite should also uh, get the information that we think that they need to have. Yet, it's not easy in Israel. Uh, to talk about these things still looks bad to most Israelis. So we will try to meet as many members of parliament as possible in the upcoming few months. We'll try to meet some of the ministers um, and, and, and hope to have, to get them at least in curious enough and feeling safe enough to ask more questions and they don't have to ask just us. We should show them that there's other, other in the arena, mm -hmm. other think tanks that think the opposite of us, mm -hmm. but let's have a conversation. Right, yeah. And 
what do you think people from outside of Israel can do to support the peace process that you describe within Israel? I mean, it, it, it reminds me of the round table that you invited me to uh, come and co-host with you uh, in Tel Aviv back in 2016. And well, actually, no, it was before then. Uh, and, uh, and you said at the time that suddenly uh, Israeli officials, uh, think tankers and others were treating you and others that think like you more seriously because there were foreigners in the room. Uh, is, there, is there something that uh, a people from outside today can do to help you uh, in this process? Well, it's, it's not just that anyone that comes to Israel and is a foreign in the room can, can make this reaction. And it's not just that they took me seriously suddenly. I, I don't know if they took me seriously, but at least they were engaging. And the reason that they were engaging was because suddenly it was an international meeting. And, and let's not belittle, uh, belittle you, Paul, but hmm. with the head of BASIC then, with, with, the, with Paul Ingram. And they already knew you, some of them. So, so getting an invitation from somebody that they already are familiar and used to talk to and to do it in Tel Aviv made, it, made a difference, made a huge difference. And if people want to help and want to do something, there are two major things. First and foremost, they should lead by example. So those uh, states that want Israel to disarm and to and still possessing nuclear weapons, they should go ahead and adhere to the new Ben Treaty and get rid of their nuclear weapons. Those who do not possess nuclear weapons and want to help, well, for years the campaign in Israel was based on very, very limited funds and volunteers that financed uh, most of the activities by themselves in Israel. If now we have a government that we can really talk to, now is the time to have a real campaign in Israel and real campaign needs I'm sad to say funds, not just uh, dedication, and, uh, and, and we need it. Uh, Some people can host us or come to Tel Aviv if they can, and if they're already in the arena and, and have an organization behind them, something that can, uh, can allow us to bring people together, they're welcome to do that too. And uh, neighboring governments, uh, what could they do right now to improve the chances of a constructive relationship with Israel uh, starting to overcome the obstacles? Because let's face facts, it's not just Israel that uh, needs to move uh, in this arena. Well, the, the, the rest of the states in the Middle East now, regardless of, of where they're coming from and why they're coming from, are sitting in one room at the UN uh, they, they've done so in November 2019, just before COVID hit us all, and they will do the same in November. And the states in the region supposed to come up with a text that they can all agree on, on a WMD, Weapons of Mass Destruction for Israel in the Middle East. So on one hand, they're doing exactly what we would love them to do. The thing is that Israel is not there. The rest of the states have to make up their mind. Are they moving ahead or are they waiting to Israel? And if they're moving ahead, how are they going to do so? If they'll come up with a text that will allow Israel to join at the end, that's the most responsible thing that they can do. Move ahead and do it in a way that will allow Israel to move. Understanding that maybe Israel can't join the room right now. People don't understand enough to do it in a way that will allow them to go back to the people of the state in, in Israel. <laughs> because if, if a prime minister will announce now, for example, that he's going to talk about it, people will be quite shocked. They won't understand it. So Israel might need some time, but, but it doesn't mean that there's not job to be done. A text that can be written, allowing us to do what we can and the rest of the states when they talk to Israel, whatever they can, to, to make sure that Israel is able to join. Sharon, thank you so much for this interview. It's, it's left me feeling quite positive, uh, as, as, it, as I always do when I've uh, talked to you. I, I also want to thank you for setting up the Middle East Treaty Organization and the energy that you put into it. But most of all, I want to thank you for working love, Paul, so you know. hard, so hard within Israel, which is such a tough place to be working. Um, 
going to finish there. Uh, I, uh, my usual uh, end point is to encourage you to get involved. You can find us uh, online at www.wmd-free.me. You can subscribe there to our newsletter, donate money, volunteer to work with us. We're also on social media, on Twitter at wmdfreeme, and similarly on Facebook and Instagram. And uh, find us on SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. I uh, hope you enjoyed that as much as I did, and uh, I'll see you uh, and I uh, hope you'll hear me at a future podcast. Cheers. Bye for now. <laughs>